Hello everyone and welcome to this one hour webinar on dispute avoidance, your options for the early resolution of commercial disputes. It's a pleasure to have so many of you joining us again today. For those of you who are new, I'd like to start by saying a little bit about Mediate Guru. Mediate Guru is a social initiative led by members across the globe. The aim of the organisation is to bridge the gap between the public and litigation by creating a social campaign for showcasing mediation as the future. So far, we have a reach in over 100 countries and we thrive to provide you with the best lecture series through access, access to the best speakers around the globe so that you can add value to your legal studies and your legal career. I feel honoured to welcome our esteemed guest for today, Mr. Paul Sills. Paul is a barrister with 26 years of conflict resolution experience. He is also an independent mediator and arbitrator, now based in London, working with Arbitrary International. In 2020, Paul was awarded the Mediator of the Year Award at the annual New Zealand Law Awards and was awarded the Prime Disputes Leadership Award for Equality and Diversity in Dispute Resolution. In 2021, Paul was also nominated as one of the top 25 most influential lawyers in New Zealand and was in October 2021 awarded with a Lexology Client Care Leadership Award for Mediation. Now, without further ado, I will pass the floor to Paul and to remember everyone to please leave your questions in the chat box below. Look, thank you very much. Um, hopefully, uh, I have a slide presentation that's about to appear on the screen. Um, while that's occurring, welcome everybody. Um, thank you for taking the time to join us, particularly on a Sunday. I'm not sure where you all are in the world, so whether it's morning, afternoon or evening, but, but welcome and thank you very much for taking the time to join me in talking about one of my uh, favourite topics in the space of, of dispute resolution, and that's dispute avoidance and, and uh, what can we do or what should we be doing about the early resolution of commercial disputes. So uh, we've got a lot of slides to get through, but uh, I really like and enjoy uh, questions as we go through. I will leave some time at the end for questions as well. But if you have a thought, um, get it down on the chat box. I've got that open beside me so I can glance at that as we are going and I'm really happy to address your questions uh, as we get through this. So, why dispute avoidance? Why early resolution? Um, well, we talk a lot about mediation, we talk a lot about dispute resolution, but I say not enough about dispute avoidance. Uh, and there's some really powerful tools available to us uh, in this ADR space for dispute avoidance that we, whether we're legal practitioners, whether we're general counsel, whether we're um, interested parties, could be tapping into to to advance our understanding of, of how to look for and, uh, and avoid disputes. And it's really about being more proactive and less reactive in conflict. Our, our traditional methods are typically reactive, whether that's litigation, uh, arbitration, uh, even in many respects, which I'll talk about briefly, uh, our approach to, to mediation, which I have some concerns over. And so the question of, are we doing enough with the mediation of commercial disputes? Obviously, I'm going to say no, otherwise it would be a, a reasonably short presentation, but I'll try and touch on why I think that is. And really importantly, um, and I think lawyers in particular don't ask this question enough, which is what service do, do the customers actually want, the people that use our services, whether we're barristers, litigation lawyers, commercial lawyers or mediators, what do they actually want for their disputes? So. Throughout the talk today, uh, I'm going to be talking about this continuum of conflict management and resolution uh, and where what I'm, I'm really talking about today sits. And it's not at this top end, it's not at this extra legal, the coercion of decision making through nonviolent or violent means. Uh, and it's not here in public third party decision making, it's not here even to a degree in third party decision making. I'm talking about looking at this area here where private decision making by parties and and how we can be more effective uh, in that space and of course mediation is a part of that space but there are many other aspects to it too and importantly and overwhelmingly the majority the vast majority of disputes in the world uh, sit within this space they don't go 
to a third party for decision making. They don't go to the extremes of extra legal coercion. Most disputes are resolved or not resolved uh, in this private decision making space. And I want to uh, challenge us to be more effective in that space. And of course, conflict avoidance is a key aspect of that space. Uh, and it can mean two things. It can mean people simply walking away from conflict, and that's a, a huge percentage of, of conflicts are simply walked away from. And it can also mean what we're looking at today, which is how do we get in front of the dispute and how do we get proactive in what we are doing? So that's what we're talking about. As I said, welcome your thoughts as we go. Now, you might say, uh, and with some um, with some uh, importance, that well, we have all of this covered. We have the mediation of litigated disputes. It's it's well versed. It's been with us for thirty years. It's it's incredibly successful. And yes, it is. But at the same time, I think it is both limited and what we use it for, and it is somewhat stagnated. And it's stagnated because of its association with litigated disputes. Um, and you know, the mediation of litigated disputes is overwhelmingly successful. Percentages range from 60 to, to percentages in the high 90s for certain types of disputes. So it's undoubtedly successful. But I do have concerns about the one day model. And I think uh, if we only use that as part of our armory, then we are limiting the scope of where we can work with parties in that private decision making space on that continuum. And some of those concerns are the fact that uh, it typically occurs uh, too late in the life, I say, of a dispute, too close to trial, too much work has been done, costs spent, positions polarised, and, and yet um, the parties haven't got rid of that great concern of third party determination, which is the uncertainty. So for me, it is too successfully aligned with litigated disputes and we need to push ourselves to look further than that. And as I say at the bottom of this slide, the one day mediation in that context has become a part of this adversarial model of dispute resolution, which we are under increasing pressure um, to say, well, we can do better than that. We can look, we can look to broader horizons than that model. And why is that? Well, Litigated disputes have these characteristics uh, and mediation of them is at times in danger of also having these characteristics. And we need to start moving away from this argument is war type of metaphor for disputes, uh, where we focus on legal rights, uh, not interest needs or feelings. We talk about them a lot in the theory of mediation, but we don't see it, I say, and very happy to be challenged. We don't see it play out a lot in a one day mediation. It's a process driven, exercise to derive a settlement. So we elevate tactics over substance. We make it us versus them and many, many one day mediations that I have sat through over the last 15 years are adversarial in their approach and they feel adversarial to the parties. Um, and often, you know, we still carry this, this outcome feeling of victory or defeat when we are in this mindset of legal rights, litigation, uh, and that does, um, unfortunately, um, come into uh, the way that we approach mediation. But there's a lot that we can do about it. And on today, we're going to briefly look at four possible alternatives and, and pick some of the positives out of these alternatives for how they might assist us uh, in conflict avoidance and early resolution. And here I'm talking particularly about commercial disputes, disputes business to business or business to customer, business to government. Uh, at, at all levels of the commercial and corporate world. So we're looking at corporate diplomacy, diplomatic negotiation, dispute, dispute avoidance and adjudication boards, and then my personal favourite, uh, early facilitated note negotiation. And we're going to look at some of the, the, the themes that run through all of these. And in my conclusion, I'm, I'm just going to touch upon what I think is, is the key issue when we are looking at these options for early uh, resolution or, dis or in fact dispute avoidance. So let's first have a look at corporate diplomacy, which as I said at the outset, we're looking for proactive ways to respond to commercial conflicts. Um, and as we know, uh, preventing a crisis is better than managing it. It's far better to, to knock it off at the pass uh, than to have to deal with, with years of litigation, arbitration, uh, even if mediation is involved. Um, now, traditionally, 
businesses have been uh, what I say economic entities. They've been focused on their customers, on the marketplace, not on the common good. They weren't they weren't engaged. They weren't obliged to uh, think too seriously um, in latter years about influences outside of their of their customer base. However, we've seen significant change in that space in recent years, and that change is accelerating. It's accelerating because of globalization. It's accelerating because of the focus of social media. Both push the commit the social aspects of business. Uh, we see it in climate change. Uh, we see it in the ESG, if you're familiar with that, environmental, social, and governance aspects of what businesses now must attend to. Government intervention, uh, uh, adversarial group uh, intervention, uh, these are all becoming increasingly large focuses uh, for business. So businesses uh, in a space now where their conflict is going to increase. It's not going to increase necessarily in the space that they are used to it, business to business, commercial conflict, uh, and that sort of thing. It is it is increasing uh, from all of its stakeholder group, which is growing by the day in terms of government, social pressures, uh, environmental pressures. So corporate diplomacy, uh, I say, um, even though a lot of it is written, when, when you, you read about it, it's written as though something that the, the business internally can do for itself. I think there are a significant aspects that we can take out of it into our own thinking about conflict avoidance, uh, early conflict uh, resolution. And so we'll start here, definition, what is corporate diplomacy? Um, it is the art or skill in dealing with people so that a business, business is done smoothly, or as uh, Professor Michael Watkins has said, the role played in advancing the corporate interests by negotiating and creating alliances with key external players, including governments, analysts, the media, and NGOs, all incredibly important. So my point is this, companies that dismiss the views and influences of external stakeholders in this environment, in our environment, and moving forward, do so at their own peril, and most importantly, will be increasingly engaged in conflict. So therefore, how do we use this corporate diplomacy idea to avoid conflict. Well, let's first look at the, the elements of, of, of corporate diplomacy. Uh, and very briefly, there's a lot more detail that you can look at uh, on all of these things. Um, due diligence. Uh, first and foremost, you've got to identify all the external stakeholders. And importantly, those, those, are those with a financial, political, or ideological interest in what you do or products that you, that you provide. Uh, and that's really important because it's a very, it can be, depending on the industry, and it is very contextual, industry specific, um, can be an incredibly broad set of external stakeholders, far broader than people uh, would first think. Um, integration is the next point. That stakeholder data must be integrated with the company, and really critically, there must be buy in from all the departments within the business. Uh, it, it involves interpersonal skills. Uh, it involves learning, i.e. the business needs to get this information and do something with it. Uh, adapt, change, uh, based upon stakeholder feedback. It requires an openness. It requires an openness in the communication uh, of, the, of the business to convey inf information in a manner that reinforces trust and reputation. And of course, businesses that don't do that uh, in this day and age very quickly, if they are big enough and significant enough, incur the wrath of social media which is while it has many 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 issues regarding communication and other things i'd love to talk about uh it has a very important role to play i think it's most important role to play as a, a global social uh watchdog uh, and mindset ongoing training and communications to ensure collective vision and collective vision there i mean is a vision that comes out of not just what the company wants to do but what its stakeholders um uh, what what value the stakeholders have, have brought into that vision as well. So here's where uh, we can start getting some traction with it and using um, uh, corporate diplomacy to, to as an early, uh, I say, awareness system, not a warning system, because warning systems, which we are well used to, we understand from, from a military context as well as other places, it's too late. If I get a warning, um, uh, because somebody's just tripped the wire on my perimeter, I'm already in a conflict situation. So we are deliberately talking here about awareness systems, systems that help us predict and see what is coming. 
Uh, now, uh, an early awareness system requires, as I say here in the third point, a curious attitude and open-mindedness. And a hint for you all, I'm going to come back to this and you're going to see this uh, open-mindedness peppered throughout everything that I'm talking about today. And I'll try and capture it for you in a quote at the very end, provided I get through all my slides. So you need to be curious and open-minded about what is going on outside the business. Um, a great example and an example that's been embedded for some time uh, is the insurance industry. They're very sophisticated at using uh, early awareness systems because they need to, particularly reinsurers, need to look decades into the future to calculate the impact of matters that they see, such as global warming, um, safety on roads, safety in aviation, all of these things that they need to almost predict for the future, they do so via these early awareness systems. An example there, Swiss Re, which is one of the big reinsurers, it was what they call their sonar system, uh, the systemic observation of nation, nations associated with risk. And they've used that to very good effect. They have saved themselves uh, on a particular pharmaceutical project millions of dollars because they were the only reinsurer who did not get involved with it because their system said that it was too risky for them. So what does an EAS system, an early uh, awareness system, look like for business? Well, it's not, you'll be pleased to know, uh, sort of a, a great extension necessarily of the existing information systems and some of the business intelligence systems that, that corporates use these days. But it's, but it's how it's applied by the, the business um, to provide early indicators and draw attentions to opportunities and risks that might not even be on the horizon yet. Um, the systems, as I say here, can help companies stay on track operationally and strategically by enabling timely and appropriate action in a proactive sense. And, and that's really where this dispute avoidance part comes in, heading things off at the pass. So, as I say, in doing so, the business can avoid conflict or deal with it early. Um, and really the focus here is, if I boil it down to what it essentially is, uh, it is issues management. Uh, so it's all about a business understanding the issues that it is going to be facing in the in the future. So as another example, what are the issues that are coming down the pipeline for climate control? What are the issues that the business might face in terms of access to fresh water, which is a developing issue around the world? What about uh, environmental, social and governance obligations that are being imposed on businesses around the world? So these are all, um, you know, real life issues that businesses need to be understanding now so they can deal with those issues before they end up in a dispute or a conflict position. And so it is all about this, as I say, preventing trouble. Um, and I've used, and I say here again, the issues of climate change and environmental issues. Um, and, and then the question is how to identify these issues um, and look for trouble in a particular industry or business. So very important to understand is that this early awareness system or this looking at corporate diplomacy and engaging with stakeholders is very contextual. It's very dependent on the business that you work in. Now, here's a checklist, um, not mine, uh, from a very good paper, uh, which I've, I've noted there on corporate diplomacy. Uh, a, a checklist to run through when you have identified an issue um, to establish whether you need to do anything about it, whether it is going to lead to dispute, uh, is it already uh, led to dispute, so therefore do you need to switch to early dispute avoidance. And it is this. The issue in this context that I'm listing here is the, the, the issue that the company has identified, a new product launch, uh, for example, uh, um, a new um, pharmaceutical they're taking to market. Let's take uh, COVID vaccinations as a great example uh, with some degree of currency. Um, so that is the issue identified. Uh, what are the arguments against the issue? First and foremost, does the issue invoke emotion? Is it going to get engaged by the public? Very importantly, number three, is it is it media friendly? Um, so will the media be for your issue? when it comes to the public domain, or are they going to be against you? And is social media going to be against you? Uh, do you share this issue with other with other companies or companies? Like, can you, you help 
um, in, a, in an industry group sense, share the load of this. Of this, who is how strong is your key activist group? Um, are you isolated in your position? Are you isolated with this issue? Um, or dynamics? How far of the dynamics of the crisis already involved? Are you already in dispute um, resolution? And I'm going to skip through these, but they are there on the, on the slides for you. The ten do's and don'ts of stakeholder dialogue. Um, firstly, be clear about what you want out of the discussion with stakeholders. Um, understand why they participate, because it's very different from why you as a business are participating in that dialogue. They don't want the money, they want the promotion of their cause. Being honest with stakeholders and being honest and reflective within your own business uh, or on the businesses that you are advising on uh, can hurt, because it's not what we are necessarily very used to. Uh, a definite um, put marketing last. Um, and this has been a criticism of mine for years over things like sustainability, where I have um, criticized business uh, and others for putting sustainability and plastering it all over their websites, but it always smells far more of a PR exercise than it does of anything genuine. If you're going to engage with stakeholders, you need to be genuine. Listening, I'm going to come back to the point on listening because it's a, it's a vital aspect of early conflict resolution. Diversity is enormously important and beneficial to the business, point six. Selecting the participants, understanding who should be in your stakeholder group and why. Negotiating uh, the rules of how you're going to engage with them. Uh, a plug for mediators, agreeing on a neutral professional moderator to help you with your discussions, really important. They do this incredibly well, I have to say, in America. Uh, and there's some, um, some of the professors at MIT in particular uh, are experts at this really heavy external stakeholder engagement over all sorts of conversations. And take your time. And, and this is a really important part of early conflict resolution and why the one-day mediation uh, struggles in this context is you need to take your time. So that was corporate diplomacy and we could talk for hours on that and so this is very much a, I appreciate a whirlwind tour for all of us um, and you know if, if there's areas that Mediate Guru or, or you the listeners want to get into in more detail always happy to, to you know, run extra webinars and, and things on this. So now we're going to turn to diplomatic negotiation. And I'll confess it's an area I didn't give much attention in my early days as a mediator for the classic reasons. Um, you view it as too, being too politically based. Um, I view it as too much small talk around embassies, too many formal dinners, etc. But uh, I've been forced to to go back on those assumptions about this. And there is a lot that we can learn from diplomatic negotiation. And in particular, this wonderful man called Francois de Callier, who was a diplomat in the court of King Louis uh, XIV. And in 1716, uh, published his book on the manner of negotiating with princes. Um, I'm just going to pause there for a sec. I'm going to have a look at a couple of questions. Uh, what do we do if stakeholders like consumers want to deviate from our core and not compromise? Well, that's a really interesting question because certainly in corporate diplomacy, uh, it is not there's not an assumption that everything the stakeholders throw at you, you are going to adopt as being in your best interest because that that would be naive to think that. What you are going to, if you are in the in the business's shoes, is take the relevant and the key stuff that you think matters, not just, and when I say matters, not just to your bottom line and to your shareholder value, but the stuff that matters to your longevity, your obligations as a business to the to the marketplace. You are going to come across stakeholders whose uh, opinions are too extreme. And we could talk about vaccination versus anti-vaxxing at, at the moment as an example of that. So um, it, it's not the case of, everything that comes into you needs to be taken on board, but the business needs to be willing to compromise and in doing so is entitled to say to the stakeholders, they're obligated to compromise as well. And compromise in this respect is not a dirty word of, of cheap negotiation. It's a reality, reality of life. It's a reality of negotiating. We compromise in life all the time because not one of us gets everything that we want. So I'm very happy and very comfortable with talking about compromise 
in any form of conflict resolution because it is about that life the rub of life between different people tribes businesses relationships is all compromise so if they're not willing to compromise then you i think you need to think seriously as a business as as how much of their of what they're holding out for you need to take uh, into into um, consideration so thank you for that question let's have a look at these six rules that i ignored for many years and and diplomatic negotiations, 1716, completely relevant today. So Kelly first offered what was then a novel idea of the necessity of continual negotiation. Uh, and this really led to modern diplomacy and having embassies uh, in everybody's uh, countries. Even then, I question whether these embassies are actually still involved in this necessity of continual negotiation. But bring that into the business, into the business context. All too often in business, we focus upon the contract, and certainly in a litigated perspective, we focus uh, on the on the contract. But the contract is not the relationship. Just as a map is not a country, it's a representation of a country. But the detail you find out by driving or walking or running or ideally uh, cycling. Um, it's the same with the contract. Even the most detailed contract does not capture the business relationship. It is a very clumsy in many respects attempt to do so. The relationship is strengthened or weakened based upon continual negotiation or whether you give that relationship any attention or not. And so whether it's with your business partners or whether it's with stakeholders, continuing negotiation is a critical function of dispute avoidance, healthy relationships. Um, no different from a husband and wife, no different from shareholders who have been together for, for decades, no different at uh, multinational level, no different at international relations level. Um, and again, hint, that's part of that theme that I've peppered throughout this talk about what are the, what's the key ingredients to conflict resolution that I see. The second point is the harmonization of interests. Now, of course, we think of um, the program on negotiation at Harvard, we think of Roger Fisher and uh, cohorts, and we think of getting to yes, uh, and we've probably all read it, and it's a great book, and Harvard has done some incredible work on this. But this idea of the harmonization of interests is not new. Uh, de Gallia was talking about it in 1716. The secret of negotiation is to harmonize the interests of the parties concerned. The, and this, the more often a negotiator puts himself in the, him, forgive the language, it's a long time ago, in the position of others. This captures beautifully what we, we talk about when we're training, um, running mediation classes and training people in negotiation is about empathy and putting yourself in the, in the, the shoes of others. I prefer to talk about, you know, the establishment of a connection be, between people, but here we have uh, in 1716, the exact same thing being said. If you want to negotiate well, harmonize interests, look for the wins, look for an understanding of what the other side needs. Um, I'm going to pause there for one second. Lovely question. Uh, is dispute avoidance practices necessarily done by legal specialists or managers of companies as well or both? Really good question. I say both and I also say others. Um, I'm always concerned that mediation and conflict resolution um, becomes too much of a legal thing. Uh, and that's one of my concerns with mediating litigated disputes is we seem to absorb the theories of mediation into the legal environment when of course it's not. One of the great um, pleasures of working in this space is it, it covers everything. Uh, social skills, psychology, neuroscience, it's everything. So. You don't need to be a legal specialist to be a great negotiator. In fact, in many instances, that might be a negative for you. Um, I think managers uh, can be incredible negotiators. Where, where, the, where the issue is, is managers and owners of businesses and executives can fall over. They can be, in many respects, incredible negotiators and very empathetic and very engaged in all of these tips. But when it is their company or when their company is getting challenged by stakeholders, that intuitive nature that we have to fight when our identity is challenged, whether that identity uh, is personal or, or business-based, uh, it's very hard to resist that. And we can become very emotional and subjective in our negotiation, which is why 
I think there is huge power in having a third party to assist negotiations, not just because it gives me work, but because there is an there's an incredible dynamic when you put that third neutral trained person into that conversation to assist. And again, we could talk all day on that. So the harmonization of interests, a great example, um, the 1978 Camp David negotiation between Israel uh, and Egypt over the Sinai, uh, run by President Carter uh, at Camp David in America. And the harmonization of the interests were, the Israelis were concerned about security. The, the Egyptian negotiators wanted the Sinai land, physically the land back. When they both understood their their uh, differing and not necessarily conflicting interests, they were able to harmonise that into the deal um, that we saw coming out of the 1978 Camp David negotiation. Uh, it talks about patience uh, and and patience uh, and persistence are often listed as you know some of the top virtues of a mediator, uh, and he captures it well here in the analogy of of, of a clockmaker, um, and I'll leave you to read that. Uh, the saturation of the mind. I, I talk all the time about um, our inadequacy of preparation when we go into um, negotiations over conflict and over um, disputes. And uh, I'm, I was very pleased to see he reflects that. Um, and it's not, a, it's not necessarily a preparation of our own position. It is a preparation in the broader sense of looking at all perspectives uh, to a negotiation. And that is predominantly spending enough time looking at the perspectives, the interests, the understandings, as far as we can tell, of the other parties involved, the, the stakeholders or the other, the other business entity. Uh, and as I say at the third point, preparation is everything. We talk a lot about flexibility and openness and negotiation, but I'm a firm believer that it can only come from a systematic and detailed preparation of what you want to achieve. Um, and so uh, De Gallier talked about the saturation of your mind. Saturate your mind with the dimension of the organizations, the countries, the people that you are dealing with. And his last point was about listening. Uh, negotiation, and this is a really important point, negotiation is about listening, not talking. Um, I can't remember the name involved, for which I apologise, but um, the negotiator who was appointed to negotiate the Northern Ireland Peace Accord um, many years ago uh, here in, in the United Kingdom, they often say that he listened the parties into an agreement, that he spent so much time listening to the respective interests of the parties that they eventually themselves talk themselves into an agreement. Um, and again, this is why I like this is it's part of the theme that I'm going to drop on you um, at, on my last slide of what this, I think, is all really about. So that's what we can take from diplomacy. Uh, and I'm very happy. Oh, and the, sorry, the sixth point, show respect. Respect the customs, respect the habits. Um, and of course, we talk a, a lot about this in modern language about equality and diversity and understanding people and cultures and how to negotiate with different cultures, etc. So again, 300 years on, nothing new. The question is, um, what, you know, have we improved? Two examples, 1980s, General Electric failed spectacularly to negotiate with the European Commission to buy Honeywell. Basically, uh, that started by Jack Walsh, the then famous uh, CEO of, G, uh, of GE, going into the European uh, commissioner um, who was uh, charged with settlement and wanting to call him by his first name, which did not go down apparently well at all because of a cultural conflict and also because the commissioner was negotiating on behalf of the EU and felt that he had a very formal and very proper way that this, this should be dealt with. Conversely, uh, Northwest Airlines in America, um, hugely successful in negotiating with KLM because they turned themselves, uh, this is, I think, about 1992, turned themselves inside out to respect KLM, respect its sovereignty as a business, respect its status, even though it was a much smaller airline um, during the course of the negotiations. As, the, as in the Northwest executive said, they turned themselves inside out to show every day that they were respecting sovereignty. And it got the respect and, and reciprocity uh, that it deserved. 
which countries uh, questionnaire, which countries uh, have best the legal mechanism to facilitate ADR? Uh, interesting question. There's a lot of jurisdictions around the world now where mediation in particular is compulsory. Uh, New York, Canada, Australia, uh, parts, some, part, some um, disputes in New Zealand, uh, increasingly so here in the United Kingdom. Uh, it's becoming a, a, a fundamental cornerstone part of any litigated process. Um, so there are a lot of uh, countries uh, that have excellent legal mechanisms to facilitate ADR. Uh, I don't think there's any one particular that I would I would say is a standout. Um, you know, a, a lot of it really depends on the sort of a cultural approach and the education behind uh, ADR and what is on offer. Let's turn now to my third my third topic, which is this question of dispute avoidance boards. Uh, used to be called dispute resolution boards, and there were, were some variations to that, but now universally from about 2014, all involve uh, dispute avoidance and, and facilitation as uh, sort of an equal ranking um, uh, object of the board uh, in, in parallel with adjudication when it is necessary. Excuse me for a second. These started in the construction industry and until recently have predominantly stayed in the construction industry, came out of America. Uh, why were they looked at? Because uh, of the increased uh, pressure on profit margins, which I, I think you, whoever and wherever you are, you would probably share as an increasing issue in, in construction around the world. Um, I do a lot of construction work, uh, both land base and marine, and it is the constant shared pressure, is the is the pressure on price, profit margins, and yet the increased complexity of what people are asked to build and be a part of. And also the construction industry was one of the earliest to have um, these non-technical demands upon it that we now look at when we looked at corporate um, diplomacy and what everybody now looks at in terms of their sustainability model, their um, environmental, social and government requirements. There's lots of environment, social, economic requirements and public interest pressure, what's being built, how it's being built, why is it being built, et cetera. So construction has had a lot of external pressure on it for a long time, which adds to the complexity ups the ante, squeezes margins. Um, and so financial instability in the construction is a huge issue. Uh, it hasn't gone away. It remains a huge issue. Um, and, and what uh, was found in the 1970s in America is that the cost of recovery, the cost of recovery of lost time, lost productivity, um, were eroding all sense of profit margins. And so we, we saw endlessly fights, and we still do, but in, in, you know, in 20 years ago, 30, 40 years ago, I think in a far greater sense, the incredible fights after the contracts had completed over variations, um, extensions of time, even more so than the, the ones that we still see uh, today and still are very much a part of, of, of many contracts. So uh, it was, it was um, a report done uh, looking at better ways to do underground work in America that, that led to the idea of dispute boards. I say they're first used in 75 on the Eisenhower Tunnel in State 70. If there's any Americans here and you've driven it, that would be nice to know. They, the board um, dealt with three uh, very significant disputes, but uh, really importantly, managed to hold on to the owner contractual relationship and the parties were all satisfied with final time and cost outcomes for the project. Now, of course, that is a rarity in many instances in construction to have satisfaction on the final time and cost outcomes for the project. Uh, I have done thousands of, of construction disputes and I can't say that I see that happening very often in the absence of a dispute board. A uh, really good question. Is negotiation itself a sign of, of the existence of a dispute or can it prevent dispute? Uh, great question. I say uh, negotiation or put it into a different context, uh, good conversation uh, and good dialogue, which is often really what negotiation is, is an incredibly healthy way to avoid conflict and avoid a dispute. Uh, or to deal with it at its very, very early signs. Um, so you've had a problem go, go, you've had a problem 
on a construction project. No one has formally said we're in dispute, but the noises are there. So, you know, you know the, 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 the signs are there. So negotiation, and let's take the context of a dispute board because we're talking about them. So negotiation over that with the benefit of the dispute board assisting the parties is the ideal way to deal with that issue in real time. Dispute, dispute boards um, uh, developed uh, sort of outside of America after that. We see the one uh, in Honduras in 1980, and then the, the 1990s really saw um, uh, it really bed in across the world. So the enormous channel uh, tunnel project here between the UK and France, uh, the equally large uh, and very complicated Hong Kong International Airport, um, one where one of my colleagues was actually working on that based in Hong Kong, so had has had really great insights into how well that worked. And then a big hydroelectric project in China. So we are seeing... We are seeing dispute boards uh, used more and more. Um, it, some areas of the world are still, I think, need to develop a bit more. Um, uh, Africa, uh, uh, South America, I know, has got great moves afoot. Uh, the Middle East, we're starting to see more and more traction with dispute boards on big projects. Um, so they're certainly coming in. As I said, uh, international growth has really focused in recent years around dispute avoidance in addition to adjudication work, which is where these boards traditionally started. So the ICC rules uh, 2015 now incorporate concepts of dispute avoidance and facilitation as part of the process. Um, the, the big one in Europe, which is the International Federation of Consulting Engineers, their 2017 update changed the name to dispute avoidance and adjudication board. So a very significant name change and intention. And the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, if you, you know it, their 2014 rules, which a colleague of mine wrote, um, both look at, both implement facilitation and dispute avoidance. And they also encourage, as do the ICC um, rules, encourage the use of it well beyond the borders of construction, which is one of my plugs uh, as, a, as a dispute board member and a great believer in long-term engagement on uh, conflict resolution. Uh, I would be very keen to see uh, this used in a broad and broader sense. We're seeing it uh, being used well in defence um, as an example and starting to see it in other, in other areas. And there are some on the, the third point, information technology, insurance, defence, uh, manufacturing are all using them. And it's, it's not just about, a con you know, construction is a great area for it, but when you stop and think about projects in any of those spaces or, or any industry for that matter, where you have time and cost issues, uh, then a dispute board in some form, whether it's one person or three people, uh, is, a, is a great mechanism to keep that relationship healthy. Uh, a question here, how do we handle it if parties are hard-headed as stakeholders? Um, well, that's, that's similar to the question we had before about do we need to take uh, into account all of the issues raised by stakeholders? And if they're hard-headed, then they are ultimately going to do themselves a disservice, I think, because if, if your business or you as a advisor to a business are advocating engagement in corporate diplomacy and good negotiation and good dialogue, and they are simply banging their head against the same issues um, that they always have, and you think there are better ways or alternative ways of dealing with those issues, but they won't look at them, then you may need to leave them behind. Because remember I said when you're in a corporate environment, it's it, the stakeholders are important, but they aren't as, as important as identifying the actual issues that are behind their interests or that are their interests and dealing with those issues. And going through that set of questions, that I had up earlier about how important is that issue? Where in its life cycle is that issue? Is it a is it a solo problem for you? Is it an industry wide one that you can gain support that you can think tank uh, and critically think your way through? So uh, it, it's it's you know it's a question of of good diplomacy as to how much you need to engage with the very or how you engage with the very hard headed. What are dispute boards great for? I'm just conscious of time, so we're going to rip through these. Great for risk management. Um, uh, they are great for dispute management because they can help with those time and cost risks. They also help with those time and cost um, factors of a dispute. 
uh, as I say there, the conventional dispute management techniques are very expensive, very time consuming, and they're not real time. Really importantly, dispute boards can help parties in real time. And it's one of the few mechanisms that we can positively engage with on big projects to help the parties in real time, as opposed to dissect everything that they have done with the benefit of hindsight. They're also good project insurance, and strangely enough, um, you get this uh, time and again where the owners of the project will happily uh, write out millions of dollars for premiums, but don't see great value in having a dispute board, where I, having spent many years in this space, would say a good dispute board is about the best project insurance that you can actually have. Um, of course, the other forms of insurance are important, um, negligence, third party, public liability, etc. But it should be viewed a bit more like a, a, a great insurance for the project. And the costs are relatively modest. Um, and it certainly costs less than any other formal dispute resolution process. All the figures around the world say anywhere between 0 0.05 to 0.15% of the project costs to run a standing, a standing board, i.e. a board that is engaged um, for the life of the project. Other benefits, there's you know, soft, soft, soft benefits around dispute boards. Uh, and back to my theme, you, which you should be able to spot by now, open communication, collaborative ex behavior, um, informal and formal processes. Once that board has the trust of the parties, then my, I see most everything being done um, on an informal basis. And, and increasingly, rarely do the parties need to resort uh, to the formal. It's there, you know, the adjudication process, it's there when they need it. Uh, and it's always there when they need it, but a good board working well with the parties can do an incredible amount informally. Um, and, you know, lots of flexibility and freedom of choice from the parties and choosing the type of board, choosing the rules that they want to work under, whether they be ad hoc, ICC, uh, Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, um, and select the members of the board. So a great believer in them. Uh, I love working in them. I think they are hugely productive for industries. They're hugely productive for any manner of projects. Uh, we do them, for example, from defense through aerospace, aviation, construction, marine, you name it. Um, they can all benefit really well from it. And then my final section we will, we will um, get through is this facilitated negotiation. And, and, and this is my question, and I've spent uh, many years, I think, working in, in this space and looking at how to advance our thinking around mediation. And my question is this, what happens do we think when we take the traditional one day mediation process and apply it not at the end of a dispute, which all too often still happens, but the early stages of a dispute? Um, and I say there, we're not, when we do that, um, we're not looking at mediation. Uh, I, I'm, I call it facilitated negotiation because too many people think of mediation as that one day model. And I'm not bagging that one day model. I use it a lot. I work in it a lot. But I, and I think it works incredibly well for litigated disputes. I think there is a lot more we can do. Question, hybrid ADR. I'm a big fan of it. Uh, not in the sense of what you'll read in the textbooks about the med-arb or the arb-med-arb -arb process. But what I'm a fan of in a hybrid sense is a, a group of practitioners um, engaged in a process uh, where as much as possible of a big dispute is mediated. And when the parties come up against a roadblock, that roadblock, if it's a legal question or they're stuck on one particular issue, that issue goes to a predetermined um, tribunal of arbitrators or single arbitrator, get a fast track determination on it, bring that outcome back into the mediation process. So it is a blend of mediation and arbitration. But of course, uh, dispute boards now by their very nature are hybrid processes. And that's what I like so much about them because they are informal facilitation and dispute avoidance boards one day, the next day they might be writing a, a, a formal adjudication outcome that the parties are in many circumstances um, going to be bound by. But let's look at this facilitated negotiation idea of taking mediation and, and really in simple terms, doing it really early in the life cycle of a, of a dispute. 
and question yourselves how many of you think the one day model of sitting down around the table and battering it out until late at night or early in the morning is going to work early in the life cycle of a dispute and i'm talking before it, proceedings have been filed before disclosure of documents before the parties have articulated issues but they have come to you or their lawyers have come to you and said we've got an issue we want to resolve it without going to court ask yourself and answer it for yourself whether you think the one day mediation model is going to work hint um, no surprise i say no it will struggle but i say but take the idea the concept of what a negotiated process that mediation is what that can do for the parties and apply that to their conflict so what i say here is i favor early resolution i've spent uh, 10 years um, pushing it as hard as i can and working in this space um, but what we what we find is early is a is a case specific thing and that adversarial model that litigation approach to it doesn't work because there aren't the same pressures uh, on parties. If parties are pushed too hard early on in the life cycle of a dispute, they'll walk away because they don't have a trial in a month's time to keep them honest about what they need to do and keep them focused. They can go, look, it's not working for me. I'm not getting what I want. I don't think this is fair. Uh, we're going to go. So very different pressures when you are doing um, conflict resolution early in the life cycle of a dispute. When can we negotiate? Um, there are no hard and fast rules, but uh, uh, when the parties are prepared to consider a negotiated outcome, not what, not what that outcome might look like or what it might be or how they're going to get there, but if the parties, I think, are prepared to consider negotiation, not even knowing what that's going to look like, then they are ready to start negotiation. Um, and I've given you here some some pointers as to um, when that might be in, in interdependence, ability to influence uh, uh, each other. Deadline pressures are always a good one, um, but again, that's an external pressure. Um, awareness that alternatives aren't great that can often happen. Uh, critically, being able to identify the part, the key parties, the key issues. Um, and they don't want to be influenced by external constraints. And you, you see this more and more, and I get more and more feedback from the likes of general counsel that they don't want to be uh, influenced by external constraints. Uh, and so this idea of facilitated negotiation early in the life cycle of a dispute, uh, I find um, a really compelling way of, of dealing with these issues. Who do you need there if you're going to um, resolve things early? Well, no great surprises, but uh, the key decision makers are vital. Um, uh, again, a plug for a neutral third party facilitator, but again, vital. Uh, I talk about bipartisan third parties, so bipartisan experts, effectively experts appointed by the parties or suggested by the facilitator. And why I say um, bipartisan is uh, in my experience on, on, on these areas, the parties benefit hugely from some objective and independent uh, mutual advice on things like valuation issues, quantum assessment issues. Uh, that can work really well, and I, enc I encourage people to sort of think about how to use effectively what, you know, call it, you know, the arbitrators, uh, the tribunal appointed expert versus the party appointed experts. It's that sort of dynamic. Or even if the parties have appointed experts, I have on, on some of these business valuation disputes, I have with the agreement of the parties appointed my own expert and then had that expert and I meet with the parties individually with their experts so that the parties can hear the dialogue between an objective third party saying, well, your valuation methodology, you know, these factors could be tweaked this way. It might have this result. And ha having the parties actually sit in and be a part of that discussion um, can be very useful. So there's lots of things you can try early um, that are so adaptations or modifications of what you might do um, during a during a litigated dispute. As I say, it's really a, it's a two-stage process, but it's really about taking that mediation concept and developing it over time and allowing it to play out over time. 
Now, example of that, what I mean is, is ensuring the parties are ready to negotiate. Um, so let's have a look at, at, at that. And getting them ready is, is, is how, how they're going to negotiate. Are they going to negotiate face to face? Uh, are they going to use their lawyers? Are they not going to use their lawyers? Are the lawyers going to run the negotiation with me and the parties are going to hide in the background? Or will the parties run it with me and we will report to the lawyers on a weekly basis? Um, exchange of information, bearing in mind this is early, we haven't had disclosure of documents. Parties won't negotiate if they don't think uh, the process is fair and they won't negotiate if there's a disparity of information. So a part of getting them ready to negotiate is negotiating the exchange of information. And on one particular project, I spent a month um, with the parties negotiating the exchange of information because one party had all the key financial information and was reluctant to give it up, even though it was a joint venture. Fairness is a huge uh, concept we could talk all day about when we are dealing with negotiation and the perception of fairness, bearing in mind, of course, that we have fairness bias, like we, uh, we seem to have a bias um, based on everything else in our lives. And then how to conduct the negotiations. Uh, again, no scenario fits all. It may be possible for it to be in a one day format. Um, with the key advisors. I have often done these where I will negotiate individually with the parties for several weeks, sometimes months, and then bring them together for two or three key days with their advisors to advance the negotiation and bring them together for a final day to get all the terms agreed. Um, conversely, uh, negotiations may need to be conducted at a distance or over time, um, using the facilitator as a conduit, you know, with a the separate room idea of the one day mediation process. Um, so it's all a very open structure. I, I say it has the framework behind it of a mediated process and all of our understanding of a one day mediation. Um, but it has this inherent looseness in terms of how to get to the same position. And I think that's, if I can say this, I think that's why it hasn't had enormous take up in the world like I think it should. Uh, and that is because I think traditionally trained mediators are probably a bit uncomfortable with this, uncomfortable with often negotiating directly with parties without their lawyers, which I do uh, even at international level, uh, uncomfortable with how to make that one day process work over 12 months. Um, so, and I, I'm, that's not a criticism, it's just I think an understanding and I'm happy to be challenged on that. but. I struggle to see why this has not had more traction um, from a business perspective um, and from a from a legal perspective. Some case examples uh, I ripped through. Property joint venture, uh, this one I think took us about five months to negotiate. Um, there was personal and business relationships. Um, the two joint venture partners were members of the same church. One was the senior, one wasn't. So that was a huge dynamic in this. Um, one held all the information. This is the one I was talking about where it said it took a month just to get the information out of the one of the parties. Um, but sort it out. You know, and very importantly, this last point, which is really you know, w where I look at when I'm thinking about this business disputes is the developments were stalled. They were holding costs every day. Uh, equity was being eroded while this fight occurred. And that is the recurring theme in business disputes that are allowed to drag on and why I work in this space to try and help us speed them up. Next one, government department, which um, this particular government department, I did a lot of work with a commercial supplier. There were um, price escalation and delay issues um, that we um, facilitated a negotiation over several months to get a result. Uh, shareholder disputes, lots of these are either helping shareholders or directors or husband and wife even, um, who own businesses that have fallen apart, had to disengage themselves, value everything, split up everything, decide who's taking what. Um, or helping shareholders actually stay in business where they have had a falling out, the relationship is terrible, um, but I will work with them kind of like a one person dispute avoidance board effectively for several years, attending their board meetings, being the foil for them to rant and rave at each other so they can build equity within the business, get it sold, etc. So uh, they're pretty interesting engagements. And finally, 
A transborder public company, this was a great one, took 12 months. Public company New Zealand, California, they spent 10 months saying, it's just going to be litigated. It's just going to be litigated. We're going to go to court. We're going to go to court. Uh, they never did. Uh, they signed up a new um, um, uh, support contract for the next 10 years, and I haven't heard uh, yet whether they're still going or not. But, um, yeah, a, a really good example of what is possible if we take the time to unpick what is going on, understand the issues, and then start restructuring uh, a deal by looking at you know all the possible options, but done over a significant period of time, 12 months beginning to end on this. Not all day, every day, of course, but 12 months of constant work and negotiation. So where do we get to the conclusion? And then I'll, I'll, I'll have a look through uh, any more of the questions that, that I can then see. And my conclusion I said is, is this, what are we really talking about uh, in this space? And what do we as humans, I think, fail desperately in? And it is this, effective communication. Honest, transparent, non-gender based, um, non-judgment uh, based, non-hidden uh, sorry hidden agenda, I meant to say, based uh, discussion, conversation, communication. What is the theme that ran through all of uh, the points I was talking about in terms of early dispute avoidance? It's communication. And one of my absolute favorite statements on it is this one. Um, and it goes back to what um, uh, Francois uh, 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 was saying when he wrote his uh, 1716 book on negotiation. Uh, and this is from the wonderful John Sturrock, uh, QC of Core Solutions. Um, building relationships between humans is a complex process. The mistakes we make in conversations and the things we think we should have said after the conversation is over all reflect our own confusion about the balancing of asking and telling and our automatic bias towards telling. The missing ingredients in most conversations are curiosity and willingness to ask questions to which we do not already know the answer. And in my humble opinion, if we could all adopt that, we would have a dramatically different planet. Anyway, that's all I have uh, formally. I thank you very much for your time. If anybody has any questions, I'm quite happy to sit here and talk if there's anybody still online. Um, but if you're heading off, thank you very much for your time today. Oh, there's a question here. What do you think of recently evolving blockchain technology, smart contracts in the context of playing a role in ADR and ODR? Uh, massive is the answer. Um, I'm talking on uh, the arbitration of uh, distributed uh, ledger technologies and smart contracts uh, in Hong Kong next month. Uh, I'm also uh, working on projects where uh, blockchain will have a significant role in uh, class action disputes. Um, so I think, uh, you know, watch the space or get involved in the space. Uh, the whole resolution of blockchain technology, the use of blockchain technology in the resolution of disputes is, is a massive area of development for us moving forward. I mean, in the UK, for example, we have the, uh, digital rules coming out of the Law Commission. I think that's what it's called, which push digital disputes towards um, uh, arbitration. Uh, I'll be talking in Hong Kong about why I think arbitration, but also I've written on why I think um, mediation, particularly with the Singapore Convention internationally, uh, uh, have a great role to play in blockchain disputes. So very big area, as is AI, as is data protection, they're all interlinked um, in terms of uh, how, how we use them for conflict resolution and how they may create or you know conflict resolution in those spaces so that's a great question uh, watch this space any other questions pat it's been you can drop the questions in the chat box if you have any questions for the speaker now
I guess there's no questions from the participant side. Shall we wrap up? Yeah, um, there's a couple here I'll just touch on if I may. Okay. Okay, uh, difference, difference between practical and textbooks, uh, everything. Um, particularly the further you get away from the one-day mediation, the less current textbooks will assist you and you'll need to go broader into negotiation skills, um, sociology textbooks and your own understanding of how to make that process work. Textbooks and formal training are great. Practice is everything, particularly when you are dealing with, with humans. Um, do you think that arbitration would work better in some situations rather than mediation? Uh, yeah, oh, look, I'm not. I'm, a, I'm an arbitrator. I'm an adjudicator. I'm not denying their validity or their importance. Um, I think we can do them better and faster to get them back into the space where they were envisaged to be and where they should be. I think um, in some aspects, arbitration has got a bit too cumbersome and a bit too expensive. But I never deny the fact that uh, some matters just can't be mediated and some disputes have to go to a judge for determination or have to go to an adjudicator for determination. And that, that's why I like that continuum as you think about the third, second or third slide that I showed because we need to live in that space and realise there aren't these distinct blocks where you can't cross the border. They, they live on a continuum and we're entitled to slide up and down that continuum even within a dispute and mediate some of it and arbitrate some of it. Um, it's it's all, my point is we should be designing better conflict resolution practices to meet the demands of particular disputes. All right, I think that's all the questions. Hopefully, sorry if I didn't capture yours as the screen has rolled up, but thank you for all of those questions. What do I think of judicial mediation? Uh, good question. Um, with great respect, if there's any judges uh, listening in, not much. It's not mediation. It's a settlement conference. Uh, it doesn't have it doesn't have the hallmarks for me of a good uh, mediation and option generation. Uh, it is heavily focused. If you go back to my early slides, on the adversarial model and um, a rights-based argument, which is influenced by the judge. Having said that, some judges can be very good mediators, but on the whole, I don't favour it. On the whole, I don't necessarily favour judges retiring and becoming um, mediators and even sometimes arbitrators because it's a different skill set. Um, and that's, just, that's not just patch protection. It's a different skill set. And what we need in the world are professional mediators who make that make it our livelihood to be as good in the space and as up to date in the space as we can it's not a retirement job this is a full-time professional engagement to be both a neutral mediator and a neutral arbitrator all right i think we are probably at that point complete yes i i think there is no questions from the participants now so thank you paul for such a vibrant interactive and knowledgeable session i would also like to thank all the participants for joining us i would requ request everyone to please fill up the feedback form before you leave in order to receive your certificates let me remind you again, uh, Mediate Guru is organizing for its students Mediation School 2021. The school will feature guest lectures from eminent mediators from around the globe with exclusive internship opportunities for students who will successfully complete the course. You can check the details at our website. Thank you everyone for joining the session. Thank you, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your day wherever you are. Take care.